Good evening, everybody. My name is Michael Doyland. I am the director of the UWM Libraries, and I'm very pleased um, to welcome you on, uh, to welcome you to this evening's lecture. The Holzheimer uh, Map, Maps and America Lecture Series, which was established in 1990, has featured many of the leading scholars in the field of map history and continues to provide a rich and diverse survey of the field. The lecture series was inaugurated by the noted cartographic historian, Professor <coughs> Brian Harley, and supported from the very beginning by Art and Dan Holzheimer. And And tonight is very special for us because it's actually the 30th annual presentation of Maps in America. So to help, yeah, I'm kind of passive, doesn't it? Uh, to help recognize, to celebrate this moment, I would like to invite uh, Art and Jan to join me and Marcy, the curator of the, uh, Marcy Bidney, the curator of the American Geographical Society Library, up in front to the podium uh, to just mark the occasion. <laughs> So I just want to thank you for your long-term support of this wonderful series and your ongoing support of AGSL in general. Um, and related to, relatedly, I'd be remiss if I didn't remark that um, uh, the Holzheimers also made a recent leading gift to fund a new AGSL Fellows program. Uh, and we have some AGSL Fellows uh, in, the, in the audience this evening as well. So <coughs> we're very appreciative of your continued support. Thank you. Thank you. The Friends of the Golden Meyer Library have also co been co-sponsors of this lecture series since its beginning, and we're grateful for them as well. <coughs> we have a few uh, Friends board members in the audience this evening, and if uh, would you please stand so we can recognize you with a round of applause. I would also like to extend special thanks to the AGSL staff. Uh, for helping to put together tonight's event, especially Kay Gildner, who is in down in front here, um, who arranged for the refreshments, and Yovanka Ristik. Don't see Yovanka, but Yovanka, who's, who's seated. Thank you, Yovanka. Yovanka prepared the exhibit of AGSL library materials, which are located um, on these uh, cases on this side of the room. And now, without further ado, I'll introduce Marcy Bidney, who will introduce our speakers. Uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome to this year's Maps in America lecture. I'm Marcy Bidney, the curator here at the American Geographical Society Library. I want to echo Michael's thanks to Art and Jan for their generosity and support in providing the opportunity each year for us to gather and hear some of the leading scholars in map history talk about their fascinating research. Um, one of the favorite things that I get to do on a yearly basis is organize this lecture. Um, I hope that you've taken time to wander throughout the exhibit that Michael mentioned that Yovanka um, and one of our um, graduate students, Georgia, put together this year for the lecture. But I also want to point out two other exhibits that we have uh, that you can catch on your way out or if you already have. Um, in the far aisle, so not this first one, but the far aisle, uh, you'll find our first pop-up exhibit. And this is something that we are doing in collaboration with special collections and archives here at UWM Libraries. It's a chance for us to highlight items from our collections and show how all three of the collections have complementary collections. The one that we have up right now is for Earth Day, so there's some great uh, maps of Wisconsin environmental history. Thank you to Georgia for putting that together. The second exhibit is our Adopt-A-Map program. And some of you may be familiar with the program. It's one of the ways that we raise funds for the conservation and preservation of maps in our collection. Your donation pays for the preservation work, and in um, return you get a printed copy of the map as a thank you for your generosity. Um, if, you're, if you've looked at them and you're interested in adopting a map, see either myself or Yovanka. And now on to our lecture for tonight. I'd like to introduce our speakers. 
And as you can see from the poster and from our advertisements, we have two speakers tonight, two for the price of one. <laughs> um, we will, they'll do two separate talks and we will hold questions until they are both finished speaking. Speaking first with his talk titled Depicting and Concealing Unknown Regions at the Northern Limits of North America on Early Maps is Chet Van Duzer. Chet is a researcher in residence at the John Carter Brown Library and a board member of the Lazarus Project at the University of Rochester, which brings multispectral imaging to cultural institutions around the world, which I was um, very lucky to witness a couple of years ago, and we're still trying to figure out how to get them here. <laughs> he has published extensively on medieval and Renaissance maps. Recent books include the 270-page exhibition catalog he co-authored with uh, Lauren Beck, our other speaker, titled Canada Before Confederation, Maps at the Exhibition, which was published by Vernon Press. In 2018, Springer published his book, Henricus Martellus's uh, World Map at Yale, Multispectral Imaging Sources and Influence. And he recently completed a David Rumsey Research Fellowship at, Stan at Stanford and the John Carter Brown Library studying Urbano Monte's manuscript World Map of 1587. His current project is a book about cartographic cartouches. Which one, any idea when that's going to come out? Uh, I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> Putting you on the spot on that one. Uh, speaking second is Dr. Lauren Beck with her talk entitled Indigenous and European Visualizations of the Northwest Passage. Lauren is the Canada Research Chair in Intercultural Encounter, Professor of Hispanic Studies at Mount Allison University in New Brunswick, Canada, and former editor of Terra Incognita. She specializes in the early modern Atlantic world and is interested in visual culture and European Native American exchanges during this period. Her books include uh, Firsting in the Early Modern Transatlantic World, in two, coming already out, 2019. Yeah, it'll be out in a couple months. Couple months. With uh, Christina Onescu visual, uh, visualizing the text from manuscript culture to car caricature and with Chet, as I mentioned before, Canada before the Confederation. She is presently preparing her next book devoted to place naming practices of the America. Please welcome Chet and Lauren. Well, thank you, Marcy, and, and thank you again to the Holzheimers uh, for supporting this uh, lecture series, and uh, again to the staff of the AGS Library for organizing everything this evening. Um, I wanted to say that uh, both of our talks this evening stem from uh, the, the project Lauren and I organized on the early mapping and exploration of Canada. So 2017 uh, was the 150th anniversary of the Confederation of Canada, and Lauren and I were talking, and we, we figured that surely someone would be organizing a conference and or exhibition uh, of maps related to the early exploration of Canada, and we found that, that no one was, so we decided to do that. And so it, it, it was an exhibition in six different venues, uh, and uh, a conference, and at the, Nash, at the Maritime Museum of the, of the Atlantic in uh, Halifax, and then also a 270-page exhibition catalog. So it was quite an undertaking, uh, and it was a very fruitful project, and uh, you'll see some of the research that went into it uh, this evening. So I'll be talking about something that's really very simple, which is a, a graphic tradition in the depiction of northern North America. And uh, what I'll be talking about in part is the, the cartography of the unknown. And maps have an inherent visual authority. We look at a map and we we, our first inclination is to think that that's how things are. Um, and the idea of a map, of course, is to depict things how they are. But when uh, the cartographer is faced with the task of depicting the unknown, uh, things get interesting. So let me try and advance here. Uh, so I'll begin by looking at uh, a few cartographic methods for depicting the unknown on maps. And uh, these maps are by Franciscus Monacus uh, in a, his book uh, published in 1527. And we can see at the bottom there, he, he knew that the, the totally hypothetical southern continent, that the, the coastlines were unknown. And so he used a straight line 
to indicate that fact that, that this was not known territory, this was not uh, territory that was mappable in detail, so he had a, a graphic convention for distinguishing those unknown, unknown coastlines. Another uh, method for depicting an unknown coastline we see here in a manuscript world map by Baptista Agnese, the Italian cartographer, made about 1550, and he knew, uh, this, this is actually a historic map, so Agnese is showing not the world as it was known in 1550, but the world as it was known to the ancients. And the ancients did not know that Africa was circumnavigable and did not know the coastline of southern Africa. So he shows that as an unknown, unknown coastline, and he does that, as you can see, by, by not using the, the dark green color, not continuing with that dark green color in depicting the coastline of southern Africa. You can see on the, the west coast he just leaves off using that dark green color. Just to, to zoom in on that. This is the spectacular manuscript world map by Pierre Desalier uh, from 1550. Uh, it's at the British Library. And uh, Desalier also had a graphic convention for depicting unknown coastlines, which he deploys on the southwestern coast of South America, the whole of the southern continent, and the northern coast of North America and Asia. And we'll zoom in on the northern coast of North America, and his convention was to show a series of peninsulas separated by rivers. So he has a little R by each of those rivers, and it's, it's quite clear that he's not depicting anything known. There's no place names. So this was purely a graphic convention for depicting an unknown coastline. He doesn't explain that anywhere, but he uses this on uh, other maps that he made as well. Uh, this is John Smith's famous map of Virginia. And so it's, it's interesting that cartographers usually don't uh, distinguish between what's known to them well and what's known unknown to them well. But Smith does that in a very interesting way, and it's remarkable that other cartographers don't do that. So if we look at this uh, text in the upper right-hand corner, he says, and he's talking about that little cross mark there, Signification of these marks to the crosses have been discovered what beyond is by relation. So what is within the, the area marked by the crosses is known. What is outside, he's heard about, but he has not seen himself. And if we look at the map, I've circled all those crosses. So that's the line that distinguishes between what he's certain about and what he's only heard about. So that 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 very forthright declaration of what's known and what is only by relation is very unusual on maps. This is a 15th century manuscript world map in, in a manuscript of Plato. And here, this, again, uh, just to orient ourselves here, South America and Africa, there's a very clear distinction between what's known and what's unknown. So he, he, he uses a different color for these regions that are still to be discovered in both the, the far north and the far south. In this map by the you know, Italian cartographer Arnoldo di Arnoldi, uh, first made in 1600, this is a 1660 printing, uh, uses a different method for dealing with the unknown. So we have at the bottom the, this hypothetical southern continent, which is labeled the, the southern unknown continent. And what he's done is to fill it with insets and cartouches. So this is a way of concealing the fact that he, he doesn't have any information to convey about the interior. And this is what we'll see in the depiction of northern North America, this use of various uh, decorative devices to conceal ignorance of the geographical details of northern North America. And we'll begin with a very famous world map, uh, Mercator's 1569 world map. So the, the contrast on this map is, is not colored. 
is not good. So just to orient ourselves, here's Africa, here's South America, here's North America. So if we zoom in, we can see that the whole interior of the continent is occupied by descriptive texts, most, most of which have nothing to do with North America. In fact, the longest text uh, talks about uh, Mercator's ideal of, of how society should operate. And he's talking about European society, not American society. And then an interesting feature of that, so we have personifications of, of, of a piety and, and uh, justice up above. And a very interesting aspect of his deployment of these decorations here is that they cover up uh, this precisely the part of the map where we, we might hope to know whether there's a northwest passage. Uh, we can see that there's a, a, a watery passage both to the east and west, but the decoration covers precisely the middle, so we don't know whether he thought that there was land or open water there. So this is uh, a way to avoid committing, uh, and it's also a way to conceal ignorance. And uh, interestingly, in, uh, in an atlas published by his son in, in 1595, uh, where some of the maps were completed by his son Rommel, uh, we can see that, that that hesitation about committing to the existence of a Northwest Passage has gone away. So the, here there is no decoration covering that, that same spot. So what I'll show is the variety of different techniques that cartographers have used, different types of decoration to conceal ignorance in the northern part of North America. And in this world map by Cornelius Claes from 1602, uh, we can see a, a, a deployment of a variety of different elements to conceal ignorance there. So we have a description of northern people. We have the inhabitants of Virginia. So uh, inhabitants from a different part of the continent have been transported to the northern part of the continent to serve this purpose. We have a description of the Sierra Nevada, the inhabitants of Florida, a description of Nova Albion. Here we have a depiction of northern peoples, that, that does have geographical relevance, and then an account of Frobisher's voyage. So we can see that various different elements, both textual and graphic, have been brought together to fill this space that would otherwise have been empty. Uh, and this, this, uh, this tendency of some cartographers to, to not leave space empty has been called horror vacui, so fear of blank space, basically, in this kind of context. This is Jodicus Hondius's wall map of 1603, which only survives in one example, which is in the McLean collection. And here is North America. And we can see that the northern part of the continent is absolutely filled with decoration. Uh, and it's, it's very interesting decoration. So we have, in the middle of North America, a map of the old world, basically. <laughs> so it's a map, an historical map, uh, and the text on it discuss the division of the world, the division of the three continents, Europe, Africa and Asia, among the sons of Noah, following the flood. And this is how the world was populated, uh, by the spread of the, the descendants of the three sons of Noah. And then surrounding this map, we have uh, roundels that show Noah and his three sons. And then here we have Noah's family tree. <laughs> so, the, the northern North America is absolutely filled with decoration that has really no connection whatsoever with North America. It's just a convenient place to put this information. That's world map by Willem Blau from 1608. This is a 1673 uh, printing. Here we zoom in on North America. And we have, uh, again, a different way of filling this space. 
we have an inset map of the northern polar regions. So in a way, a, a space that was unknown has been filled with a map of a space that was almost as unknown, we can say. And uh, Nikolai Vischer's map of the Americas, uh, 1657. We have a very different way of filling this space. We have this gratuitously large lettering, <laughs> North America. And then, in again, rather large lettering, larger than it needs to be, a brief text on the discovery of America by Columbus and Vespucci. This is Cornelli's map of North America from 1693. And at this point, uh, parts of northeastern North America were, were known, so this decorative material has moved to the northwest. And if we, we look at this... Um, <coughs> this decoration, it's, it's really quite puzzling trying to figure out the symbolism, and it turns out that this cartouche really has nothing to do with North America. We have the title there, but the, the, the imagery uh, actually comes from a decoration, a decorative cartouche that Cornelli used about the Strait of Anian, so this mythical strait separating North America and Asia. Somehow he saw fit to take that, that imagery and transport it to North America, again, with the, the function of filling this space in the northwestern part of the continent. This is George Wilde's map of North America, and again, we, we have this concentration of decorative material in the northwestern part of the continent. We have a portrait of King George of England, <laughs> the title cartouche, and a personification of America and then a display of items available for sale in Wilde's shop. So this is used as advertising space. And if we, we zoom in, we can see some of the, the, the great variety of items uh, that are available in his shop, and he describes them in a text at the bottom. So this is Chatelaine's... Uh, very curious map of the Pacific, as he calls it, from 1719. And again, we have another way, another decorative uh, element used to fill this space in North America. Here we have uh, portraits of explorers. So in the, the Northeast, we have texts about the early exploration of North America. Here we have texts marking the limits of geographical knowledge, and then beyond those limits, we have these portraits of explorers. And this is Philippe Wache's uh, Carte Physique du Canada, 1754. And so here's Hudson Bay, Great Lakes. And here we have his remarks about the map, about how he went about making the map, and those cover up the western part of the continent. And at the, at the top, covering the northern part of the continent, we, continent, we have an inset, uh, his redrawing of an indigenous map. Uh, so again, a great variety of decorative techniques used for the same purpose, which is to cover part of the northern, uh, the, the northern part of the continent. So I've shown a variety of examples of diff different techniques for filling this space with, with uh, different decoration, but I don't want to give the impression that this is true of every map of North America. Uh, so I, want, I do want to show some sort of counterexamples. So it's, it's never the case that all cartographers uh, thought uh, the same way about how to address a problem. So uh, if we go back to Arnold the Arnoldy's uh, world map from 1600, and zoom in on North America, we can see there is blank space there. He has uh, some rather vague rivers, uh, but he evidently did not feel that same compunction to uh, sort of blank out this whole part of the continent with decoration. We just have these two relatively small cartouches, and of course he could have made them larger if he had wanted to. This is Sanson's uh, map of North America from 1650, and you, 
you can sort of feel the absence of some decoration in the northwestern part of the continent. But he was very comfortable. If he didn't know what was there, he was comfortable leaving it blank. And that's, as we've seen, not true of many cartographers, but it was true of others. It's interesting that there's a, a later printing of this map, which we see here from 1669, where the, this cartographer did not have that same comfort with leaving that large space blank and has moved the cartouche to occupy that space. And uh, here we have uh, Georges-Louis Le Rouge's map of America, north and south. And we can see that he has uh, put in some details in, in a lighter uh, with a lighter pen, as it were, in light print, uh, because they were not certain. Um, and he is very comfortable with that. So he's comfortable depicting something he's not certain about and did not feel that compulsion to cover over the area with decoration. He had some reason to think that this that uh, geography of North America was as he depicts it there. He wasn't certain about it, so he depicts it differently, uh, which is similar to what we saw earlier about it, but there being a different system for depicting coastlines that were not known with certainty. And I will close there. Thank you very much. And here's Lauren. Thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure to have had Chet go first because he's presented some of the same problems that I'm going to build upon, but with respect to the Northwest Passage. Um, as you know, I'm from Canada, and so for us in Canada, but for everyone around the world, the Northwest Passage has remained a curious, uh, intriguing, but also, I think, to some degree, a contested space, much as it was in the early modern period. And occasionally in the Canadian news, we hear about foreign ships, um, maybe an American submarine or a Russian airplane lurking in or above the northern waters, um, which occasions discussions, in our country at least, about sovereignty and borders. And also, of course, in recent years, we've seen increased commercial traffic in the Northwest Passage as the ice has been retreating or melting and made that um, uh, route available to us, connecting the Atlantic to the Pacific, or the Pacific to the Atlantic Oceans. So the pursuit of the Northwest Passage on the earliest maps, um, I think is conceived in a very similar fashion until more recent years, when we see the ice melting. Um, European maps such as this one transform this northern space into a place that can be occupied, conquered, uh, according to European laws and practices, also settled, civilized, to use an 18th century term, um, filled, because they're viewed as being vacant, uh, developed, and we might use that term more today. Um, and in medieval Europe, but also maybe even today, we tend to think about the northern part of the world, and maybe even the extreme south as well, as being less developed, having less abundance in terms of uh, infrastructure compared to, say, southern parts of Canada or other, other regions of the world not <coughs> located in the north. Um, and so the project of the Northwest Passage, if we think of it as a project, is no different than the project to find other waterways that penetrated the continents of the Americas. So we have at hand the example of the Strait of Magellan, or Panama, which was an isthmus that was traversed by both indigenous and Europeans in the 16th century, well before that for indigenous people, from the Pacific into the Caribbean Sea until it became eventually uh, dredged, and now we have the canal. So these waterways, uh, those two that I just mentioned, are, were, became, quickly became very important uh, waterways to Europeans in the 16th century. Uh, and of course, it was important that they were located within, in that time, Spanish territory. They were claimed by, by Spain. 
So a map uh, of other parts of the uh, world, or other parts of the Americas, say in North America, where the British and the French were trying to um, find their own colonial milieu, we see on those maps an increased uh, commitment to the project of finding some form of transcontinental waterway that would allow them to reach um, Asia, for example. <clears throat> this map, uh, and I'll zoom, uh, this map is created after the Cartier and Roberval voyages and is south oriented. So the part that would be viewed as uh, Canada comes toward the bottom. And it shows one such waterway. I'd like to sort of follow this waterway uh, uh, for, for a few moments before turning to look at how the Northwest Passage materializes. This waterway is called the River of Canada, which today we call the St. Lawrence River. Uh, and it shows uh, to the north, um, so toward the bottom, uh, the space that we would think of as being maybe Labrador or, or, or that area uh, being filled with a group of colonists and then to their left there's a group of white hairy people. And there's some disagreement about the white hairy people who they might be. Uh, certainly they do not resemble uh, indigenous people who are not known for their hirsutedness. Uh, and in medieval Europe we have uh, uh, legends that circulated about a, le a race of hairy white people who resided to the north in the north of Europe. So what seems what some scholars think is that that race of white hairy people from Europe have uh, trans been trans transported over here to Canada. Uh, but and so they take up space in the north before Europeans apprehended the vastness of the north of this continent. But they also do more than take up space on the map. They, uh, they, they inseminate themselves into the territory. They racinate or create roots in a very a priori uh, sort of way. And by racinate, I mean that they exert a primordial white presence here in lands where, uh, well, we know that Europeans didn't, didn't originate from this region of the, of the world. Uh, the north in this way becomes occupied in absentia, but on maps we can detect uh, several te techniques such as this one that allow Euro settlers to take up space in places where they're not really hanging out, they're not really living or, or, or can be found. And Canada's north, uh, in, until more recent times, could be characterized in this, uh, in this way. Champlain continued this uh, project the following century, pushing westward, and we know he goes well into the Great Lakes Basin. On this map, he expresses his knowledge um, all the way uh, toward the west uh, with a lake that, whose coastline is not quite closed yet, promising that to keep following more westward, uh, we would find uh, hopefully a, a water route. And that was one of, his, uh, one of the outcomes that he was tasked with, to find ways of reaching the Pacific uh, Ocean. So by no means uh, should we think that Champlain was unsatisfied with his work because in his footsteps came missionaries who pushed the map even further and uh, on this map here which depicts um, the colonies and indigenous nations as known to missionaries in the middle of the 17th century, uh, uh, this map depicts uh, the promise of pushing westward. I'm going to zoom in uh, in a moment on the western part of the map. What's also interesting about this map is that the place names are rendered in, um, uh, are, are the indigenous names for the places, or they're named after the nations that represented, that were, that were located in certain regions at the time, particularly relating to the Algonquian and Haudenosaunee, or Iroquois confederacies. So I'm just zooming in there on the westernmost part of the map, uh, Great Lakes Basin, going in from uh, Huron into Lake Superior, here called the Grand Lac. Uh, we see the missionaries' uh, belief that the route eventually may take one to, to China. <laughs> These maps comprise examples of, uh, how, of the promise uh, that something may be found uh, in the future, some waterway or, or fluvial connection uh, may be found in the future, but nonetheless constitute waterways uh, that do not exist or have not been confirmed for Europeans, indigenous people, they know a lot more about the land, about the entire continent, in fact. Whether there's a waterway toward the top is accessible, whether there's a transcontinental uh, waterway in what we would call uh, present-day uh, Canada. 
What's different about this map, as I pointed out before, is the place nomenclature. Missionaries, in particular, by this time, had figured out that by awarding names like St. Marie among the Hurons uh, to certain areas was not very helpful for finding one's way if they were interested, for example, in trying to reach the Pacific Ocean. So uh, they had started to ask Indigenous peoples that they met along their way, what's the name for this place? and they began to use those names as a way of more effectively transacting or, or finding their way across, across the land. Um, and so in general, when we see, begin to see indigenous place names appearing on maps, we know that there is interaction between Europeans and indigenous peoples, which tends to promise uh, better quality cartographic da data informed by expert uh, experience. So let's look at three representative maps that will allow us to problematize how the Northwest Passage uh, was, was mapped, particularly because it has ex existed until recent times um, without being confirmed, without being known to actually exist. The first of these maps, uh, there's a facsimile of it on display in the exhibition that accompanies our talks, is by Michael Locke a merchant who worked in the Middle East and the Mediterranean, also a navigator. And it accompanies a proposal that he made to undertake further exploration in what we would call Canada's uh, uh, Northern Sea. Uh, and he collaborated with the likes of uh, Sir Philip uh, Sidney, uh, Richard Hakluyt, um, and that circle. Uh, he also funded uh, or helped support, anyways, Frobisher's edition, uh, expedition, which occurred a, a little bit before this map was created. Locke was a visionary. He, en he envisioned a circumpolar uh, trade network uh, around the world. He believed that uh, indigenous peoples would be interested in purchasing uh, British commodities, for example, cloth. And when you look at British travel narratives from the latter part of the 16th century, beginning of the 17th century, it's really interesting how British authors mention every now and again their perception that indigenous peoples are interested in cloth because of um, how they dressed or didn't wear cloth at some times of the year. Uh, but he, Locke also thought that indigenous peoples had something of value to sell him. And he, he wanted to have a valuable exchange relationship, which is a, makes him a bit uncharacteristic in the period in terms of how he was thinking about indigenous peoples as, as partners. Nonetheless, the map uh, depicts uh, primarily uh, uh, Europe, places where Europeans had visited. He names many of these places after Europeans. He even names an island off, after himself. He uh, notes down where um, Europeans arrived, for example, Cabot, and the year in which he uh, arrived. Very little of the place nomenclature is, reflects indigenous uh, knowledge whatsoever. A couple exceptions, like Appalachian, for example, for the Appalachia people. Um, and so his map comprises European, uh, his, his knowledge of European presence in the late 16th century. But it doesn't really involve any indigenous knowledge. He didn't consult any indigenous peoples, neither did Frobisher. As we know, Frobisher kidnapped indigenous peoples, brought them back to uh, Britain, or they died on the way. But he didn't seem to learn anything valuable that would help him find a Northwest Passage, which was absolutely what this map uh, was about. This map also expresses uh, toward the, the left and above what we imagine to be California, the Sierra Nevada, in the Pacific Ocean. Uh, there's some, some textual details there that expresses Locke's anxiety that the British and the Portuguese, who could now sail from the Moluccas in a, in a very few number of days to more or less this region, might detect as they approach the Americas once again the entranceway to the Northwest Passage, which would then lead to questions of sovereignty. Who who claims the Northwest Passage within their colonial milieu. More than a century later, uh, European efforts to map the Northwest Passage enter a new phase. And this map uh, is also on display uh, in, in, the, in, the, um, in, the, in the case at the end of the exhibition. On this map, there's two components. In the north, we see Hudson's Bay clearly delimited there. We see uh, the toponymy in that area characterized by English language place names, which uh, in Canada, uh, in my research anyways, tends to indicate a lack of interaction between different people. So for example, in the Atlantic 
uh, in the Atlantic region of Canada, we've had for um, centuries indigenous, francophone, and, and anglophone communities interacting, fighting with each other, living together, trying not to live together, and the place names reflect that as they are commingled. In Canada's north, we have a lot of English language uh, place names uh, still today. Dobbs, who created this map, uh, did so because he was unsatisfied with the Hudson's Bay Company's terms of operations. They were, they were awarded a monopoly in the north, but with the caveat that they continue the project of exploring the north. So Dobbs was unsatisfied, he thought the HBC was not doing his job, and he uh, undertook a campaign to uh, allow other expeditions to occur um, or to change those terms of reference, but also in the HBC's pricing he thought was unfair because indigenous people didn't want to sell their furs to, to, to the HBC and would rather trade with the French and make more money. Dobbs uh, backed an exhibition to locate the Northwest Passage a few years before this map was made, but like so many expeditions, it had to turn back due to the ice, which, is a, a, which has been one of the biggest uh, bar barriers to uh, e expeditions ever since they first tried to start navigating the Northwest Passage. This map, however, is a little bit different in that although the North, as I've already said, appears to represent only uh, European knowledge that's not really all that informed by anything new. Uh, the southern part of the map is quite different, and I've been studying this map for years, interested only in the Northwest Passage, so I don't really look at anything below Hudson's Bay, because I, I just didn't think it was of interest. Mm -hmm. But if you look at the cartouche, your mind will be changed. Uh, as this cartouche indicates, the mixed blood uh, Cree French man, Joseph La France, provided the map that is situated, the component of the map situated to the south of uh, Hudson's Bay. And I'll go back to the map in a moment so you can take a look at it. La France drew this map on the floor of a London pub for Dobbs, and he should be considered the map's co-creator, certainly, but I've never found him listed that way in a library's catalog or metadata. So hopefully that will one day change. The map uh, that he provided uh, essentially comprises a biography of La France's life, uh, and Dobbs outlines some of this in a treatise that accompanies the map. Uh, La France had knowledge of the interior of Canada in ways that allowed Dobbs to see a second means of accessing the north, via precisely the riverine passages that connected Hudson's Bay into the Great Lakes, uh, uh, Great Lakes Basin. And thus, he was able to make use of indigenous knowledge uh, in order to make to to uncover these fluvial connections that might allow him to access remote parts of Canada's north. Yet he considered to see the north and other parts of the Americas. Dobbs became a governor of I think it was North Carolina as a, a space that was uh, available, unoccupied, unworked, uncultivated, and whose resources could benefit him or someone else, and so not necessarily the people who lived in that, in that region. His knowledge relied on the practice of making discoveries as a unidirectional uh, transgression into a place, and then publishing that information again became a unidirectional, a unidirectional act uh, that only uh, benefited Europeans, but also was comprised of European knowledge in the first place. He did not make a great attempt beyond La France to consult the experts uh, who knew about a Northwest Passage or other means of connecting to the resources that he so desired to explore, exploit. And so that brings us to our third phase of seeking the Northwest Passage, which embraces finally the experts, but in a different way. This is a hard map to look at. I'm going to show you a schematic in a moment. The mixed blood Cree British factor, Joseph Norton at Churchill River, grew up with Meatonabe, who, who was a Dene Cree man. Cree was their common language, although it seems likely the Meatonabe knew English, possibly French, because he, he, was tra he was a trader but also an interpreter. He knew a bunch of different languages, handy guy to have around. He also knew a lot about the geography of the north, which is quite common. So he and a companion, Ido Leazzi, undertook a several months long journey to a place that was named the Coppermine River. It was called the Coppermine River before anyone, Europeans that is, had even confirmed that there was copper there. Much like the Americas, which were named the Indies before India's, before um, uh, Christopher Columbus even, even left home. 
Uh, so they went there to confirm whether there was copper. Upon returning home with some nuggets of copper ore, they handed Norton a map, this map, which Norton had copied from the original on deerskin. Uh, and he also added some conventional cartographic uh, uh, details, like a compass, uh, like a compass to orient us, um, for the HBC authorities in London. Norton then took this map over to London and uh, uh, with an argument, with a pitch, because he wanted support to, re to, to, to launch another expedition. I'm just going to turn this map 90 degrees. Uh, so that the south is at the top, it's a bit easier to read. This, this schematic is from uh, Malcolm Lewis. So here we see the departure, the very top in Churchill uh, River, of, uh, of, of the first expedition by the two um, Dene Cree men. And rather than sail along the bay, and then uh, head, so, so, so go north along the bay, Hudson Bay, and then go west, which is a typical direction when you're looking for the Northwest Passage, these two men didn't use a boat at all. Rather, they went uh, over land uh, in order to reach the Arctic Sea. Coppermine River is in present-day Nunavut uh, on the Arctic, Arctic Sea. The map is quite interesting because it details their uh, experiences along the way. It provides us with the different markers in order to wayfind or ensure that we understand where we, are, where we are going, what to expect. So for example, off the route, the men knew that there were Inuit tents. The Inuit and the Dene did not like each other. They would, uh, they would war with each other. Uh, and so they saw signs of the Inuit, but they didn't meet the Inuit. So they added that to their map so that in the future they would know about that and hopefully avoid a serious confrontation. So it was important for their survival. Barbara Bellier has characterized this form of indigenous map, and many indigenous maps are very similar, um, as being kind of like uh, a map that we would use for a metro uh, station, where the map itself does not correspond to the topographical or geographic features as a typical uh, Western map would, but rather it's about movement. So a map such as this will tell you how many rivers, how many mountains, how many lakes, what sort of uh, physical markers you might need to find your way. Much like a metro map will tell you how many stops, which stops have elevators, which one has a cafe, and so on and so forth. Important information for finding your way, um, finding your way to your destination. And the map was successful in more than one way. Not only does it illustrate a route to reach the Arctic Sea in what would be the territory of Nunavut today, it also convinced the HBC authorities to support replicating the trip uh, with Samuel Hearn's expedition the following year. Hearn drew the, his own map, actually he drew several maps, both uh, also like local scale ones, um, that, uh, that are very traditional or typical of 18th century uh, cart cartography. And incidentally, Meatonabe led that expedition with Hearn to retracing his own expedition a couple years before, and it was on their way back, I believe, that they encountered Inuit, and Meatonabe, according to Hearn, massacred all the Inuit, uh, and it really shook Hearn up. He seemed to be quite bothered by it, haunted him. He said that there was so much blood in the water that he awarded the toponym Bloody Falls to one particular place where a, 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 the seeming massacre had uh, occurred. Absent from the Hearn map, which is much more interested in replicating the physical topographical features, is that experience of movement, the, the, of being compelled to move across, uh, uh, the, across the land, which you see in Meatonabe's uh, map. Put another way, Hearn's map is about arriving at one's destination. These expeditions also underline the fiction that the Northwest Passage would allow Europeans greater access to trade. It doesn't seem to be the case uh, whatsoever, particularly when we think about what resources were being harvested in and around Canada. If it wasn't in the waters and the fisheries, for example, in the Atlantic region, it was in the interior, in furs, for instance. And that remains true until more recently. This painting uh, depicts one of the Ross expeditions. We can see that he is there being informed by um, indigenous uh, individuals and how uh, challenging this must have been to communicate about what lay beyond a certain expanse, particularly when one wanted to find a Northwest Passage. We have to think about this. A Northwest Passage was not something that indigenous travelers or Inuit travelers used. It wasn't something that was important to them. They would go over land or use other, other, other means. This is a, 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 an entity or a geographic feature that existed um, uh, since 
before Europeans got up into the north. And so finding uh, this pursuit uh, could not have made a lot of sense uh, to do this, say, through it with a boat, for example. A friend of mine, uh, Inuit, uh, upon the occasion of locating Franklin's ships, Ross um, pursued the Northwest Passage as well. Franklin was pursuing the Northwest, Northwest Passage, not so successfully, unfortunately. Um, but the ships were recently found, and one of them, the finding of one of them coincided with Canada's 150th um, anniversary as a nation. Um, and so my, my friend provided me with some important context for the maps by Locke, Dobbs, and Hearn, but also for the expeditions by the likes of Ross and others, uh, others in the following decades. With respect to Franklin's ships, she said to me, we knew where they were all along. All you had to do was ask. <laughs> she grew up in the community on the bay where one of the ships was found, and, um, and her comments really left lasting impressions upon me. Because on the one hand, um, I asked myself, why didn't Europeans and later settlers embrace the, wa the way-finding technologies and techniques of indigenous peoples, rather than adhere to a faulty plan to use a boat to navigate through ice? Um, which technologically they, they were not prepared to do, and they, 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 had, they really struggled to deal with the cold as well. Um, on the other hand, the concept of, this, of the Northwest Passage is a Euro settler one, so no wonder it doesn't really work, or hasn't until more recent times uh, worked. And as we continue to explore the northern uh, waterways, um, we're seeing things change in the north. Place names are disappearing as ice shifts and uh, lands turn into water. Um, and incidentally, for the 150th anniversary of Canada, one of the government-supported activities was a cruise, a Northwest Passage cruise, because we can do that now. It departed Halifax, and three months later, you would arrive in Vancouver as a way of celebrating, reifying, consolidating Canadian identity through this finally available passageway that we have to admit is only available, quite likely, due to human-caused climate change. And as we are increasingly in the north, um, we're seeing... Uh, continuing and active sites of colonization among the Inuit who live in the north, a decrease of their cultural diversity, their practicing of their, of their customs and their, and their knowledges um, in the north, and with an increasing presence of settlers like me, maybe like you, in the north. Um, so Northwest Passage, yes, it finally exists, but what's fascinating about the maps is how it has never existed, not really, uh, until, until more recent times, thanks to climate change. Um, thank you. So we've got time for questions. We've got two microphones, so please do not start asking a question until we have a microphone in front of your mouth. So <laughs> Yeah, there's a new book about uh, by uh, Patrick Young about uh, Nicolet, and uh, the first half of the book is all about Champlain, really, and he crossed the Atlantic maybe 30 times, I think, and it, I was amazed on maybe after 20 years before he finally gave up the idea of finding the passage. Can you explain why he held on to that so long, the idea? <laughs> well, it was in one of his, um, so most... I'm going to say all the explorers were given patents or orders from their sovereign or whoever gave them permission to undertake the voyage. And uh, for him, one of his uh, jobs was to find a passageway of some means, anyways, of accessing the Pacific. So um, I don't know if he ever gave up on it. Uh, maybe I've not read all of his correspondence, so I'm not sure if, he's, if he really gave up on it entirely. But certainly the project to push west was something that he did for most of his time, but he had other factors too, like wars, he had to build the relationships with different indigenous people along the way, the whole settlement colonizing thing too, um, he had a lot of, he had a lot going on. Um, and as a cartographer, we're really lucky to have him as a cartographer because he, he embraced the practice, and so we have these beautiful detailed maps from, uh, from Champlain, who are, which are informed by his experience as well, we can't say that for many of our maps. I have a question for a check. Um, so I was just wondering, with like these maps um, and putting like things into the blank spaces, was it more of like a fear of the unknown, or was it also used like as a like almost advertising and printing their maps? 
Uh, yes, I, I don't think it was fear of the unknown. Uh, so one way to look at it was uh, how, how to make the best use of space on a map. And, uh, uh, and if you think if you're in the business of selling maps, blank space probably doesn't help sell them very much, whereas if you add a decoration, there's another element of the map to, to catch someone's eye. Good evening. Uh, I'm a student here in Professor McGinnis's History of Photography and Map Making class. And uh, in our course, we've studied extensively in uh, medieval and early modern European maps like the 15th century Liara map that hangs behind you. And I know you referenced the 1569 Mercator map as well. Uh, present in both, there's um, symbolic depictions or references made to monstrous figures or mythical figures as well, like uh, the biblical barbarians Gog and Magog, or depicting native peoples as cannibals in the Age of Discovery, or um, showing a fear of Islam uh, in the wake of the Crusades. In any of these maps uh, in the northern regions of North America, are there any evidence of symbolic depictions or references made to uh, any monstrous figures or mythical figures that, in your opinion? Beyond the white hairy people. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm sorry, so you, you were asking about monstrous peoples depicted in North America? Or any reference to like uh, monstrous figures or uh, <coughs> mythological figures maybe uh, of an unknown or showing a fear of whether that's like in a negative or unknown light. Mm -hmm. Um, well, I think on the first map that I showed you, the Ruich map, um, it, it contains references to Gog and Magog, and it, it, it projects the idea that Asia and uh, Newfoundland uh, and whatever else is, is known at the time, relating to what we call Canada, it, it's contiguous territory, um, and the land of the Great Khan um, is apparent, I believe, on the, on, the, on the second map I showed you as well. So there is that sort of like mixing together, but that's when Asia and North America are believed to be one continent. When they're separate continents, there's some different sort of monstrous figures that appear. Yes, and so uh, Raleigh has a map that shows uh, some of the traditional European monstrous races sort of transported uh, to the New World, and there's actually uh, a very good article about specifically that, that process of uh, taking monsters from European traditions and <coughs> making them appear in, in North America. So there, did, there definitely was uh, that, that process of uh, sort of creating monsters in the new world. Mm -hmm. And of course we have the Amazons, like in other parts of the Americas, there's more explicit relationships with those monstrous acts or people. In the North, I guess they're a bit different, but... Yeah. Chet, in the maps that you showed, there was a, a, quite a difference of the map to the relative size of the world in the early maps. Some showed a lot more water and a lot more space, and others were very close to the edge. Do you have any comments about how the cartographers learned about the relative size of what they were mapping to the world? It's changed quite a bit in those maps. So the relative size of North America in, in relation to the world, do you mean? North America and also the European continents versus the world. Um, I, so I, I, I think it's just a, a difference in scale of the maps and then the, the parts of the world they chose to depict. So some showed just the Americas, some showed just North America. I'm, I'm not sure I'm fully understanding your question. The ones that showed in all the continents, both Europe and Africa, Asia and North America and South America, those maps, when you compare them to the relative size of the world, which you showed earlier, there's quite a difference in the space north and south of the land. I'm wondering, showing that the world was, was that the that the world were a smaller part of, of the total mass of the world. And I'm wondering if there's something you could comment on that, because they all had a different view of that. Yes. Based on the maps you showed. Yes. I, I'm so one aspect of that is is the size of North America. 
um, and certainly uh, on, on maps from, say, the middle of the 16th century, uh, there was no clear idea of, of how far North America extended to the west and, and whether, in fact, it, in, in, uh, it was coterminous with Asia. Uh, so that there was great uncertainty as to how far North America extended, and thus, on like on Mercator's 1569 map, uh, North America is shown as, as much larger than it is in actuality, and thus it has proportionally a greater size in relationship to Europe than it should. And so the Mercator Mercator projection uh, makes the North and the South look a lot bigger. So if there's water up there, uh, or a cordiform. Uh, map makes the um, the sides of the world look bigger. So if there's uh, oceans framing, so that, that must impact the the relative proportions as well. Uh, great lecture, by the way. Thank you. Uh, there's kind of a tragic history of the Klondike gold rush that applies to both lectures of the Edmonton luring the gold rushers to say you could get to Klondike the easy way. Edmonton. Uh, did they go into blank territory, or were they using indigenous maps, or did they have anything at that point? After the 18th century, my knowledge gets a bit dodgy. <laughs> <laughs> my head's turned by earlier maps, but uh, um, I, I would expect by that time, because the fur, but because uh, the fur trade had extended well into that region, that there were well established trails and. Uh, roads of some nature that, and then, then settlements dotted. Because even in the 19th century, uh, there's small little settlements of indigenous or European or mixed communities um, throughout there. So I, I imagine that they followed some existing pathways. <laughs> All right, we've got one time for one last question here. Uh, this is a question for Chen. I was just curious if you had found that there were um, <clears throat> other regions throughout the cartographic history of the world that had leverage similar uh, spaces to fill in areas of unknown. Specifically, like the interior of Africa had a Ptolemaic uh, precedent, and I was just curious if you had found other instances of that uh, occurring in other locations. Yeah, the other location I would mention is, is precisely the, the hypothetical southern continent uh, that I showed on, on the one map, the Arnoldy map. Uh, and I, it would be quite easy to put together a talk uh, that, that went through the different visual strategies used to fill that space with a variety of texts and images. So, um, Africa, there is uh, at least some of that. Uh, so, there's a, a great uh, Cornelli map of Africa where he has uh, a, a large cartouche, and the cartouche is talking about the sources of the Nile, and it covers precisely the part of Africa where you would have depicted the sources. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we're going to uh, wrap up. Before we um, thank uh, Chet Moore, and, and I have your attention, I'm just going to make some announcements. Because <laughs> then we start clapping and you can't hear me. Some upcoming events that I'm going to mention. Um, next Wednesday, uh, upstairs on the fourth floor is the annual Friends of the Golda Meir um, Library Lecture, and the title is Art, War, and Peace, Celebrating a Major Gift of French World War I Posters from the <coughs> Benalia family, and Pat Benalia has generously donated her collection of French World War I maps to the American Geographical Society Library here, um, and we are celebrating that gift next week with a lecture. Um, down in Chicago, the weekend of May 3rd is the Chicago Antiquarian Map, Book, and Ephemera Fair happening at the Newberry Library. If you want more information and or to register for that, you can do a quick Google search and find the information. Um, and then finally, I'm not usually this on the ball for planning next year's Map of Maps in America <laughs> lecture, <laughs> but thanks to Susan Peschel, I am this year. And so next year, I don't have a date just yet, but our speaker will be Tom Patterson. Um, he was a cartographer for the National Park System. He's going to be talking about um, national park mapping. So thanks to Chet and Lauren for a really wonderful talk. Please you, you point can... out Patrick Young's new book, The Misunderstood Mission of Jean Nicolais, published this year by Wisconsin Historical Society. It's, I'm sure, of tremendous interest to everybody here. Uh, speaks in detail about Champlain and Nicolaeus's